Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here tonight um, and welcome to our meeting. Uh, this is a meeting being um, you know, uh, created uh, by Bronx Nipan and also we have some uh, a partnership with uh, Nipan as well. And as you will learn tonight, we are partnering with uh, other organizations like the Debt Collective, uh, they're, they're panelists here. They're gonna talk about um, this issue of debt and debt cancellation. And we also have um, Carolina Rod Rodriguez, and we're gonna get into the introductions um, fairly shortly from Community Service Society of New York. But um, yeah, so once again, welcome and thank you for being here. And this is our Navigating the Road Ahead Student Loan Relief and Payment Resumption. So I, I, I hope that you're excited about this topic. Uh, I know that I am. I'm actually a um, student borrower. I own a lot of money. And we're going to get into that, into the different programs that exist and the movements that are, you know, that have grown, um, you know, from this fight. And so we, I belong to Bronx Nipan, and we, I, I also have some of my um, colleagues here from Bronx Nipan as well. And we are a group uh, based in the Bronx. Um, we are a chapter of Nipan, that's the New York Pro Progressive Action Network. And just to give you a little brief summary on it, um, it was uh, created um, back in 2015, 2016, um, you know, uh, with the uh, inspiration of Bernie Sanders. And so there were many groups across the state um, that were formed and supporting of Bernie Sanders. And so what happened afterward was that we created this organization, right? Because we believed in um, Bernie's uh, platform and his vision. And um, and many of these groups are still, um, you know, organizing and are still um, active today. So Bronx uh, Bronx Nipan is actually a chapter of um, Nipan, and we are expanding the work on the local level. And uh, we, um, you know, advocate and we fight, and you know, for the New York Health Act, for instance, for um, for. CUNY, Free CUNY, for instance, and other local progressive uh, movements, you know, throughout the city, throughout the state, and throughout this country. Um, so yeah, we have, as I mentioned before, we have an exciting topic today. Um, and as you uh, are aware, this is called Navigating the Road Ahead, Student Loan Relief and Payment Resumption. And um, we, we actually, want to, before we um, start this uh, conversation, I want to actually drop a link. Um, it's an icebreaker, and we're going to drop that link. It's an icebreaker um, with several questions, and um, we're going to give those results at the very end. And I have with me Ting, who is going to help me to put those on the chat. And if you can help us with this. Actually, they're still up in the middle. They're not in the chat. Everybody should be seeing it right now. Are can you guys you up on that? The... That's the first one. Oh, I see 11 people answered. Yeah. And what's going to happen is we're going to, you know, have a, a, a few of these poll questions and we're going to uh, give the the results at the very end. Another couple of seconds on this one. Okay, we'll close that one. And this one's a longer one. Oh, painfully high numbers. And 
Anybody else going once, going twice? Uh, what, how do I access it? It's right in the middle of your screen. If you're on a phone, you can't do it. I did the last one. Yep, you should see you a new one in the middle of the screen. Can't see a new one. Hmm. Does anybody else see it? I mean, people are answering it. I guess people are. Uh, uh, don't know. Where would it? Just really? in, the, in the middle of the screen, of the black screen. I don't see okay. it. Well, I'm going to end that poll and go back. Okay. Here's the third one. Oh, here we go. How here many years to, to pay, pay off. off? Right. I didn't see the second one. May have to do a little calculating on this one. Okay, I didn't. Oh. I didn't pay mine off, so. Oh, well. <laughs> Either everybody paid it off, or it's painful to think of how many years it's going to be, or something. Only got one taker on this one. Anybody else? Give it a few more seconds. Oh, 21 to 30. I don't know. Anybody else on this one? Going once. Going twice. Okay. And the question on how you paid it off through some program or hmm. Juan, I, I don't see a lot of responses. Only six so far. <clears throat> Maybe that's the people that had the had the debt. <laughs> okay. Going once. Anybody else want to answer this one? Oh, there's seven. Good, good. Okay, going once. I'll end this one and go to the last one. Hmm. Yeah, anybody can answer this, whether or not you have student debt currently or ever had it in the past. Fourteen takers. Any anybody else want to weigh in on this one, or is that it? I'm going once. Okay, we'll end that one and back to you, Nestor. Sold. All right. So we actually have George Albro. Is that correcting with yes. us? And you see I, him right I, there. I I asked him to join us so he can tell us a you know just give us a little history of Nipan and the importance of Nipan. And so, George, uh, this is uh, your space now. <laughs> Thank you. I just got off the subway. <laughs> um, uh, I, I got to say, I'm old enough to have gone to Brooklyn Law School when there was no tuition. Uh, and that, I guess it was a few years after Bernie. There was a $35 per semester fee, a bursa fee that they charged. And we demonstrated against that. <laughs> the chutzpah, I know. <laughs> but um, that's how that's how it should have been. <laughs> and that's why uh, how it should continue. And the, the other thing I like just to say is um, 
uh, the senator in the, in the assembly who was sponsoring the bill to make CUNY and SUNY again tuition free is my good friend and, and my senator, uh, Andrew Gennardis. And he's a very, very smart uh, person and very, very um, uh, diligent. And he's going to fight for this. We just got to help him out and get some allies. And this is how it should be. This is a great issue. I want to thank Nestor and Gene and Ting and everyone who helped put this together. It's a tremendous uh, event and tremendous issue. Uh, as far as Nightpan, um, Nestor talked a little bit about the history. Uh, we were, you know, we came together in 2016 because we got 80,000 signatures to get Bernie on the on the ballot. Uh, all volunteers. It was a record. Um, and because we needed to get signatures all over the state, we had, you know, rank and file, just community groups got together and did this. And then um, after the convention, we sent a hundred some odd delegates to the convention. And then after that, we decided to stay together to fight for Bernie's program. We have 15 chapters. Um, in the last few years, we've been fighting for um, election reform. You know, we were part of the coalition that got early voting um, and all the other reforms. And New York has been transformed from uh, one of the worst states to one of the better states now. Uh, making They just passed this law last week that the governor signed, making uh, mail voting uh, much easier. Um, we also uh, sued the Board of Elections and the governor and everyone when they canceled the primary in 2020. If people remember that, right? Um, you know, they were going to choose the delegates, not the voters. We sued them and won in federal court. Um, we were a big part and early part of the coalition that defeated the uh, the IDC, which prevented so many different people reforms from, uh, you know, getting passed. You know, the Democrats, these Democrats, they, they put the Republicans in power, even though they had the majority. It was outrageous. Uh, and uh, Jeff Klein was the leader of the PAC, and uh, he was defeated uh, by uh, what's her name? <laughs> I forget her name, but she was a, she's wonderful that defeated him. But these are the type of things that we have done. Uh, our chapters are uh, autonomous, um, and they choose their own representation. They choose their their bylaws. Um, but they're part of a larger group that fights for these bigger issues that affect everyone, like loan forgiveness, like um, student um, uh, student loan forgiveness and no tuition. Uh, and right now, our big issues are the New York Health Act. And we, despite the odds, despite so many people not really fighting as they should for this issue, we are never going to abandon this issue until it's passed, ever. And it's going to pass um, because of the dynamics of the healthcare system. Um, and th that's a, a big issue for us. Um, and uh, housing is becoming a big issue. The no co good cause uh, eviction law, that's going to pass. My prediction, that's going to pass next, uh, next term. Um, it's an election year. Too many people are for it. The governor is never going to veto it. She just doesn't want to have to deal with it. But it will pass. And uh, that's going to change the dynamic of, of housing in, in this state. Um, so, um, you know, that that's it. I, you know, I just don't want to take up too much of your time. I want to invite everyone to be active in NIPAN. Uh, and again, uh, uh, thank Nestor and 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 Jean and the leadership that you guys are providing uh, in the Bronx. This is one of my our most dynamic chapters. It's really amazing. Thank you, George. Thank you so much for making it and for rushing uh, to get to us. Uh, we we appreciate that, and hopefully you can stay too, so you can learn. Uh, do you have any student uh, that uh, George? Oh, no, I think you mentioned that uh, it was free in your time. Um, $35 you... semester, I didn't have a lot of undergraduate debt. 
Awesome. Um, so, so yeah, so let's get started here. I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, put some, some like headlines in your, in your, in your minds right now, as we're about to hear this conversation. So, and to, and to give you, you know, some reference of, you know, why we decided to, you know, uh, create this event and, and educate people on what's next, right? Um, so the Supreme Court struck down Biden student loan forgiveness program in late June, as uh, many of you are, are aware. On a six to three decision, um, we heard that Chief Justice Roberts, um, you know, argued that Biden was overstepping um, his legal authority, right? And so we also learned that so many students, um, so many um, borrowers were looking forward to this uh, relief, right? This forgiveness. Um, although in this movement, you know, we, we wanted like full, um, you know, we, we wanted the elimination of those loans, but, you know, at least it's a first, it's a, it's a first step, right? Um, in the right direction when you have up to $20,000 of your debt, um, um, you know, eliminated or forgiven. And so the, the courts struck this down and this is a, a big impact on everyone, right? On stu student borrowers. And for me personally, you know, I can think about the $48,000 that I currently owe. You know, I graduated in 07, from College of Staten Island. And, you know, because of interest and because of, you know, pausing on payments, um, not earning enough money, uh, I've come to this point, you know, where I owe $48,000. And so to many other individuals, like in my case, um, people that just got out of college or people that have been actually out of college for a while, it's been a struggle. Um, we were faced with the pandemic. Um, there was a pause on those payments, on interest being accumulated, and so much happened during that time, right? And so people have changed careers now. Um, people may not, you know, be earning the same money they were earning before COVID, um, and the cost of living is going up, and and all these changes, right? So it is impacting people in many ways. Um, and so, you know, as some of you may already know as well, um, this payment re resumption will start uh, next month, you know, October October 1st is the date that they have given, although <clears throat> they have given me my, my uh, due date, which is October 26th, I think. Um, so my, my bill or my uh, continuing to pay my bill is going to, come up uh, pretty soon next month. So with all that said, I, I'm you know very excited to introduce you to our first panelist. Um, her name is Carolina Rodriguez and she's from Community Service Society of New York. She's here to give us you know to talk uh, to us about this um, Supreme Court decision, um, you know how that went down and talk about different programs that um, the Department of Education is working, right, to, and along with the administration to make sure that, you know, they are keeping somewhat their promise. And so I'm really excited to um, have her speak with you on this. And for now, I'm just gonna read her, read you her bio. Um, Carolina Rodriguez works at the Community Service Society of New York as the director of the Education Debt Consumer Assistance Program, otherwise known as EDCAP, which aids student loan borrowers in New York State. Under, the, under her leadership, Carolina initiated the program's helpline and smoothly transitioned into a remote service model during the pandemic. Today, the program operates across the state in collaboration with a network of community partners yielding substantial benefits for numerous New Yorkers grappling with student loan debt. Before her <clears throat> current role, Carolina held the position of Associate Supervising Attorney 
within the Health Initiatives Department at CSSNY. In this capacity, she managed a broad reaching network of community-based organizations and small businesses, guiding consumers through health insurance and healthcare access matters. Her oversight also extended to the management of New York State's largest health insurance enrollment network. Carolina is a distinguished academic holding a master's in social work from Columbia University and a JD from the University of California, Berkeley. These credentials reflect her dedication to both social welfare and legal expertise, enabling her to bridge the gap between these critical areas of service. And so without further ado, I'm going to present to you Carolina Rodriguez. Thank you, Nestor, uh, and thank you to Naipen for hosting us today. I'm sorry that my own bio was so long. I will keep that in mind for the next time produces a shorter bio because I really want to spend the time sharing uh, what I think it's critical information. So um, as much as we're going to provide a little bit of background, I am expecting to give you um, practical information that I hope it's useful to you. And so if someone can just confirm that you can see my screen and um, I will also mention that my colleague Nancy is with me tonight. So if you have any questions regarding anything related to student loans, payment resumption, put it in the Q&A or q and I'm sorry, put it in the chat and my colleague Nancy will be able to, to answer it there. At the very end, I'm gonna uh, hopefully reserve a minute or two to be able to answer any like burning questions that may be relevant to the entire um, group. Again, I'm gonna go through a lot of information and I'm gonna do it really fast, but I'm kind of used to doing that. So hopefully I can keep it within a limited time. This is our agenda. I'm gonna skip the agenda because I'm just gonna dive right in. Here's our contact information. The importance about our contact information and you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation if you're registered for this event is that we offer free and unbiased one-on-one -on -one counseling services to anyone who has higher education debt. I say higher education debt because we can help you whether you have federal loans or private loans or at times if you're dealing with a direct to school debt, meaning you got some financial aid, you dropped out and that got converted into direct um, school debt. So all that to say, um, our goal is to help as many people in New York manage and whenever possible eliminate their student loan debt. That is our passion. That is our mission. We will use every avenue that we have at our disposal to help you tackle your student loan debt. We recognize that a lot of people high, have high loan balances where even if they wanted to, they would not be able to repay back their entire loan balance within their lifetime. So our goal, again, is to help you figure out what is the best strategy for you to tackle that debt. We are funded by New York State and we do have a network of 10 community-based organizations that you can see briefly on the map. You can go to our website at capny.org to see those agencies and obviously access our services through our helpline or via email. Uh, what exactly do we do? We explore or discuss with you your best repayment strategies and discuss forgiveness programs everything in between. For folks who have student loans in default, we get them to out of default in good standing to avoid wage garnishments, um, tax intercept and all that stuff. Okay, I am gonna go one minute over the brief history of student loans. And I'm just going to highlight some things. You have this deck if you want to review it. So one thing to recognize is that uh, college became a thing in part because of Sputnik and our competition to get someone in the moon that we thought we need to educate people to compete worldwide and STEM science funding was front and center. Then we had uh, World War II and a lot of people coming back from the war and we were thinking like, what are we gonna do with all these people? So we're like, why don't we give them benefits to go back to school? And the racial disparity started before that, but let's say when it came to access to higher education, it was very prevalent because there were a lot of black um, service members coming back and just picture segregation, not access to colleges, universities and all that stuff. So it started from back then where again, uh, minorities were not given the same level of opportunities as other veterans. And that obviously has an impact on generational wealth. 
Fast forward to the next phase, we develop a system, a lending system, where we allow third-party banking institutions to lend the money directly to student loan borrowers, and the federal government said, go ahead, lend it, and we'll back up the loans. If the student defaults, we will pay you off and then take care of that loan and go after the borrower to get payment on that debt. So we created a, a bunch of loans known as FFEL. Again, these were loans given out by banking institutions. The problem with that is that the banks were making all the money with no risk or liability because again if someone defaulted the federal government would step in and pay them off so in essence the banks had an incentive to keep student loan borrowers in debt in perpetuity because they would just be making money guaranteeing that the debt would be satisfied by the federal government in case of default so that was uh, the FELL program. 1993, the government realizes, well, this is a bad business for us because we're holding all the liability and all these banking institutions are making the money. So they created what is known as the direct loan program, but they didn't promote it. So still in 1993 and a few years later, the FELL program, the banks were still lending the money to student loan borrowers, which was like bad. And then in the process, we decided to give uh, student loans the highest protection and said, you cannot discharge your federal student loans in bankruptcy. We're going to make it nearly impossible to where 1998, in order for you to discharge federal student loans through bankruptcy, you had to show undue hardship, meaning you had to show that you couldn't pay back your student loans and be able to have food and shelter. Literally, that standard is still true today where it's really hard for someone to discharge their student loans through bankruptcy. 2007 is critical because a new income driven repayment plan, the ICR had been established by the IBR is created and the public service loan forgiveness program was also created in 2007. The problem with that is that a lot of the borrowers at that time were still holding FELP loans and the public service loan forgiveness program said only direct loans are eligible for this program. Hence, we've had over a decade of people thinking they were going to be able to get their loans discharged through PSLF, only to find out that they couldn't because they had the wrong type of loans. Fast forward, uh, the FELP program ended and now the government lends borrowers uh, the loans directly to them. So most people now moving forward or all people moving forward will have primarily direct loans. 2023 is meaningful because the Biden administration, as you will find out, released a new repayment plan called SAVE, which is more generous. And in 2023, they're trying to fix a lot of the mistakes and programs um, that they've had. Okay, so that's a little bit of background to hopefully uh, help some people understand the difference between direct loans and FELP, and obviously the disparities that continue to be perpetuated. The Biden and Harris cancellation, as Nestor mentioned, it was struck down by the Supreme Court. I'm not going to go too much into the details. There were two cases. Ironically, the case where the court found standing was brought by a few, by a few states, uh, with Missouri being at the forefront. The Supreme Court said, yep. They have standing and this is overreach under the HEROES Act. Um, the Biden administration was obviously upset about that. And they said, well, we're still going to do something under our higher education of 1965 authority, which gives the Secretary of Education the power to waive release uh, any title claim, meaning student loans. So that is going to go through the negotiated rulemaking process where they're going to have several meetings and convene a group of people, experts arguably in the field, including potentially the perspective of student loan bar and some advocacy groups. And they're gonna see what is feasible in terms of a forgiveness program. But we can expect that it's not gonna be as simple and it's not gonna be as broad based as the 10 to 20,000 that the Biden and Harris cancellation tried to implement and that was struck down. The key takeaway from all this, however, from a practical perspective is that the Supreme Court decision only impacted that one program and it didn't impact the array of other relief programs that are currently available to borrowers, which I'm going to talk about. Okay. Covering a lot. Okay. What you should know, like right now, let's step back. July 1st, the new income driven repayment known as SAVE uh, became available. I'm going to show you what it does and I'm going to show you how you can enroll to, if you haven't enrolled in it and you might benefit from it. Everyone knows in September, interest began accruing. And as Nestor mentioned, Next month, next week, payments are due. Not everyone's going to have the same due date. If you were paying before the COVID forbearance, you can expect your due date to be the same. Um, 
be aware your servicer is supposed to send you an invoice at least 21 days before your first payment is due. We are hearing from a lot of borrowers, a lot of confusion about invoices, um, letters, conflicting information. I have good news so you don't like stress too much if you're in limbo uh, in the next few months. Okay, so I'll talk about that. Uh, the federal government is implementing the IDR account adjustment, which I'm going to go into and you want to be aware of because you might benefit um, and you may need to take action. So be aware of that. I'll cover that. For people who have their student loans in default, and I should know that the Bronx has the highest default rate, I believe in some communities up to 18%, which is really high when it comes to student loans. Um, and most people have low levels of student loan debt. Um, so be aware that there is this program called Fresh Start that allows you to get out of default. That's going to be available for another year. Um, and it clears your credit history. Okay. Here's the thing to know. If you're stressing out about your payment due in October, I'm going to ask you not to. I mean, I'm going to ask you not to. You might still stress. The reason being is if the your servicer is still processing your income-driven repayment plan or there is a little bit of a mess going on where you don't know or simply you don't have the money next month, don't worry. The federal government is not going to be reporting any late payments, non-payments, to the credit bureaus. In fact, what they plan to do based on our understanding is if you don't pay, for example, the first three months, October, November, and December, they're automatically and retroactively going to put you in an administrative forbearance to prevent you from having any adverse impact or damage in general to your credit. Now, they don't have control if if by any chance uh, the credit bureau sees a non-payment during that time, which they shouldn't, but just in case, there should not be a, a, a big or any credit impact. That's our understanding at this point. So if you need a little bit more time because you're not ready to pay next month, don't stress, you should not see a hit on your credit. This on-ramp period, as it is called, is gonna be available for the first 12 months, a year, if you need to take advantage, the only caveat is that if you're pursuing a forgiveness program like public service loan forgiveness or income driven repayment forgiveness, which I will talk about more, um, that month in which you do not pay may not count towards those forgiveness programs. So just be aware of that. Student loan repayment checklist, really quickly, these are the things that I highly recommend you do if you haven't already. You want to make sure that your contact information is updated with studentaid.gov. Studentaid.gov is actually the federal government's national database where they store all your federal student loan information. You want to update your contact information because you may be getting important correspondence from the Department of Education and they should have your right email. If you don't know, the second point is, if you don't know who your student loan servicer is, I highly recommend tonight or tomorrow, you go to studentaid.gov on the right-hand co corner on your dashboard, you're going to see who your student loan servicer is. Hopefully, you only have one. Some people may have two or more. Um, reach out to us if you have more than one. We can help you figure it out how to make sure that you have one. Um, all that to say, you need to create an account or have an account with your student loan servicer. A lot of bars are in denial for the right reasons, I feel, for them. You need to have access and make sure that your servicer has updated information because they're the ones that are going to be sending you your invoice and posting it in your account. Who are the servicers? Mohila, Nelnit, Advantage, Ed Financial, those names should resonate. If you don't know, go to studentaid.gov to find out who they are. Choosing the right repayment plan, you want to make sure that you know your repayment plan options and select the one that best works for to, for you right now, arguably, and hopefully for long term. I'm going to talk about repayment plans shortly. Know your amount and due date. As I mentioned, you should get an invoice 21 days in advance. Flag that due date. Um, prepare your bank account. If you were enrolled in auto debit prior to the payment pause, you're going to have to establish it with your student loan servicer. It does take potentially a couple of weeks for that to be set in motion. So pay attention to that. There is a 0.25 interest rate reduction if you sign up for auto debit. All this to say, also, if you're not ready to pay, as I mentioned, don't stress, you have a little bit more time we highly recommend that you explore your repayment plan options, however, because you may be eligible for a low uh, repayment plan that gets you credits towards um, some of the forgiveness programs that I'm going to talk about. Okay, 
this is the popular plan that I think it's amazing. I've been doing this work for a few years and it's really transformative. Some of the advocates we speak to believe that this is more impactful than the 10 to 20,000 in student loan cancellation in part because it may give you more benefits um, long-term. And for a lot of borrowers who may have more than 20,000 in student loans, it, this may be more helpful than that. So the way to think about repayment plans before I give you the details of SAFES, there are two buckets of repayment plans. There's the first bucket, income-driven repayment. Income-driven repayment is just the umbrella term, and there are four income-driven repayment plans under that umbrella. Revised pay as you earn, which is now SAFE, that got replaced by SAFE, pay as you earn, income-based repayment, and income-contingent repayment. They all sound like very much alike, and that's part of the confusion. Uh, but know that all those four plans are based on your household size and income, and they're not based on your total loan balance or interest rate. If you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness or income-driven repayment forgiveness, which forgives your debt in 20 to 25 years, you would need to be enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan right now. And as you'll learn more about, SAVE, S-E-V-E, is the more popular one, and you'll learn why. The other options of plans are what we call traditional plans. Those are not based on your income or household size. Those are based on your total loan balance, your interest rate, and a predetermined payback period. If you have a mortgage, think like mortgage-like. And the predetermined payback period can be from 10 years up to 30 years. So it can be a long time. And in general, under traditional plans, the names are standard, graduated, and extended. Minor differences, uh, Some the graduated, for example, starts you with a low payment and it goes up every two years. The extended means that you just get more time to pay them off. So be aware, big takeaway, income-driven repayment plans have a forgiveness component, and that's why we refer to that forgiveness component as income-driven repayment forgiveness. That says that after 20, if you have only undergrad loans in general, or 25 years, if you have any graduate loans, your remaining loan balance gets forgiven. I know that that sounds like a mighty long time, but you might be surprised how many people actually have been trying to repay their loans for 20 to 25 years. So SAVE, what is special about SAVE is that it's actually reducing the required payment for borrowers from like 30 to 50%, depending on their income that they had pre post COVID, let's say, in general, that is happening because the federal government under this plan has increased the amount of money that it's excluded in their formula. All this to say, if you're a single borrower making less than 32,000, your required payment would be zero. If you're making 40,000, you can expect to have a payment and so forth. Uh, it, it does take into account your household size. So if you have dependents, that should lower a little bit your payment, not a lot, but like $40, $50, I feel, if you add a dependent, it lowers it, which could be meaningful to person families. So that's the reason why SAVE is, is now the most affordable repayment plan for most borrowers. For other borrowers, with some exception, there could be, um, let's say, the ICR plan, which may be more affordable because they have a low, low loan balance. Not going to go into the details of that because it will take a whole hour. Now, the added benefit of SAVE is that if your required payment doesn't cover the interest rate, the federal government on a monthly basis is going to like write it off. Let's say that on a monthly basis, your interest would be $100. And let's say that your required payment is $50. Well, you would pay your $50. And in the old days, you would have $50 left in interest that would be accumulate, accumulating. Nestor share how he started with a lower loan balance and now it's bigger, right? Like eight ten thousand $10,000 bigger. And that's in the old system and the old repayment plans your interest rate, if you were not covering it on a monthly basis, would accumulate. Under the SAFE plan, if you're enrolled in the SAFE plan and your payment doesn't cover the interest, the government is just going to write it up. That is key, and that is the government attempting to rein in increasing loan balances, which I think is great. A big takeaway from um, SAFE, if you're married and file jointly, they will count your spouse's income. If you don't want your spouse's income to be counted, you would have to file separately. Reach out if you want more advice. Usually you might have to talk to your accountant or do the number crunching yourself to figure out what's the benefit from a money perspective if you file jointly versus if you file separately and reduce your student loan payment. Overall, 
If you're the one making most of the money, it may not have a big impact. If your spouse is making more meaningful money, then it may have a bigger impact. Again, it's a math number crunching um, analysis for you to figure out whether it makes sense to file separately or jointly for purposes of uh, your repayment plan. The following is not in place right now. It's going to be in place next year, July 1st, 2024. SAVE is going to continue to reduce the monthly payments for borrowers next year. So phase one was implemented. Phase two of SAVE is going to be implemented next July. And what it's going to do is for people who only have undergraduate loans, instead of paying 10% of their discretionary income, they're going to pay 5%. If you have only graduate loans, it will still be 10%. But if you have a mix of undergrad and graduate, it's going to be a weighted average. So you would be paying anywhere from 5 to 10% meaningful uh, difference. Uh, we've done hypotheticals. And Nancy, if you can put in the chat or EdCap a safe calculator for people to play around with it um, when they have time to, to see what their safe amount may be, that would be great. Um, the other big thing that I think it's very important for us to continue working, especially in the Bronx, and I mentioned that the high default rate and people who might not have finished school is next year for people whose original loan balance was less than $12,000, they can get their loans forgiven when they have been in repayment for 10 years. So we could see a good number of people being eligible to get rid of the remaining loan balance um, next year as a result of this feature in the SAFE plan. Okay, how do you enroll? Do you go to studentaid.gov? You're going to go to loan repayment, then you're going to go to income-driven repayment, and you're going to start the application if you haven't done it. Or if you were if you were in repayee, you should have automatically been transitioned to safe and you don't have to, you should not have to do anything. So the application is 15, 20 minutes. If there's data matching, it should be almost a breeze, not entirely, but almost a breeze. If you're married, they will ask you for your spouse's name and social security and date of birth. Be aware of that if you're going to sit down and have that information handy. Um, it's going to walk you through the system. You want to select, you want to enroll in an income driven repayment plan, and then it's going to populate based on your last year's tax filings, uh, your repayment plan options. Again, now that you know about SAVE, that is arguably the best repayment plan. If you go through the application and you feel that SAVE is not the cheapest, reach out to us. Let's have a conversation of what may be best. The one caveat about SAVE is that it's not, um, parent plus loans are not eligible for the SAVE plan. Parent plus loans are eligible for the income contingent repayment plan, and that's the only income driven repayment plan that they're eligible after they consolidate their direct parent plus. Here's my takeaway. If you're dealing with parent plus loans, you need to reach out to us. We need to have a separate conversation. It's a little bit more complicated and options are different for parent plus loan borrowers. Okay. Exploring forgiveness, cancellation, and discharge options really quickly. These are the top programs that we want everyone to know about. The first one that I've been talking about is the income-driven repayment forgiveness. Remember, all the four income-driven repayment plans have a forgiveness forgiveness aspect to it. The general rule with some exception is that if you have only undergrad loans after being in repayment under an income driven repayment plan like SAVE, your remaining loan balance get, gets forgiven after 20 years. If you have any graduate loans uh, disbursed, then it's going to be 25 years under SAVE. Again, Pay has an exception to that, but that's the general rule. So the key is for a lot of borrowers, see if they can afford save uh, because worst case scenario, there's an end in sight. I recognize 20, 25 years is a long time, but it could still be an option, the default option. IDRF does not require employment as long as you're enrolled in the income driven repayment plan, you would be accumulating credit. Okay. Public service loan forgiveness is for people who work in the nonprofit or government sector, as long as they're working full time, which means 30 hours per week on average, they can have their remaining loan balance forgiven after 10 years. This program is now very popular, and I can say that I had my loans forgiven under PSLF, so yay, it's working. At, at last, it's working. It only took me three years to, to get it through, and I do this job, so that tells you how complicated this was. Um, it's a great program. I encourage everyone, and I'll talk about the flexible rules shortly. Um, this is probably the best program for people who are in the public service sector.
hands down. Bar defense to repayment uh, is for people who went to a school that defrauded them. And we see that a lot. Unfortunately, there are some for-profit schools that are not great and just defraud students. Um, you can submit an application online for borrower defense to repayment, and you can have the loans that you took out to attend that institution um, discharged. There is an application, and it takes a long time for you to hear back, but that is an option for people, again, who were defrauded. If you just didn't have a good college experience or you thought the quality was not good, that's not going to count for borrower defense to repayment. It has to be fraud-like that you were induced into taking these loans, you were promised a job, and they never came through. The last one is also a favorite of mine. I like, this is probably my most favorite. Total and permanent disability discharge says that if you can prove that you're disabled, either through a social security administration letter, a ver veteran discharge letter, or by completing a form, um, by having your physician complete a form uh, describing your disability, um, they will discharge your student loans due to disability. Uh, a big requirement is that you cannot engage in substantial gainful activity. What does that mean? That means that basically you cannot really work to sustain yourself. It doesn't mean you cannot work at all. You can work, but in general, like you just can really support yourself. Um, that doesn't mean like you cannot support the quality of life that you may want to. It's more of like a standard um, life. Um, the application is available and it's that program is managed by NELNED. Um, the best part about it is that if you think you qualify, there's no downside in terms of having your doctor complete the application, you submit it, and you may hear back within two months. I've had clients that have seen their loans be discharged within like two to three months, two months to get a decision, and then like another month or so to see their loans discharged through this program. Again, you do have to be disabled. We usually talk a lot about TPD with older borrowers who, you know, may have health conditions. The IDR account adjustment. So remember all that chaos with like the banks lending the money, then PSLF only applying to direct loans and all that mess. The government said, yeah, we recognize we screwed up big time. We're going to try to fix it. So under the IDR account adjustment, they're basically telling borrowers, we will give you credit both towards public service loan forgiveness and income driven repayment forgiveness under very flexible rules. We are going to give you credit as long as you were in repayment. We will give you credit for some forbearances and we'll give you care credit for, for some deferments. The only time that they're not really willing to give credit for is time in default, non-COVID time in default and in school deferments um so i don't know if you guys heard like a few weeks ago the government came out and said that over eight hundred thousand borrowers were going to get their loans discharged that's through this idr account adjustment where they're going back from the beginning of time and doing data matches and if the loans were disbursed 20 to 25 years ago and they've been more or less in repayment even with some forbearances and deferments the government is just giving them credit and saying we're going to assume you were making payments and we're going to assume you were enrolled in an income driven repayment plan so under the income driven repayment rules we will discharge your remaining loan balance after 20 years if it was undergrad only 25 years more or less if it was graduate loans today i had a client who didn't realize she had 95000 discharge under this program and like when i confirmed that it was real she just started crying because she had been trying to pay this for over 25 years and it was like a lot of money. So it, she just, I mean, I could cry with her because I can only imagine the relief of never having to make a payment. So this is real. It's happening. We have clients and Nancy can attest she has a lot of clients who have been able to benefit. Uh, the key to this, as you will see, is you need to make sure you have direct loans. If you don't have direct loans, if you still have those older bank owned loans, or even if they're held by the Department of Education, they are known as FELP or Perkins, you need to consolidate them by December 31st in order to make them eligible for the retroactive credit for, for PSLF if you're pursuing PSLF and for the retroactive credit for income driven repayment forgiveness. Next year, the federal government is going to give borrowers a status update in terms of where they are at towards the 20 to 25 year forgiveness program. Not early next year, probably late, late next year. But that's great because then borrowers will know if I just stay enrolled in an income driven repayment plan like SAVE, I could be done and have my loans forgiven X year, right? Within X number of years. 
If you have borrowers that have loans in default, as I mentioned, Fresh Start is going to be an initiative that they want to take advantage. They make a call to the default resolution group, most borrowers, and then request Fresh Start and their loans are sent to a servicer in good standing and then they can enroll in a repayment plan. This is the best thing and we want to encourage as many borrowers who are in this situation to take advantage of this. What if things go wrong? I'm providing three agencies that you can escalate to if you're getting wrong information from your servicer or you got the wrong determination, the FSA Ombudsman Overseas Student Loan Servicer, the Consumer Financial Protection is interested, probably more in private loan issues than federal loans, but you can submit a complaint. And here in New York State, the Department of Financial Services, it's actually a state agency in New York that oversees student loan servicers or program at CAP is overseen by DFS and we work closely with them. Um, they're great. I mean, I really like their 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 um, oversight powers over the servicers. So I encourage you that if you have any issues, make sure you, you file your complaints. I am not gonna go over this stuff in detail because I wanna be mindful of time. Um, these are some state bills, uh, a couple that were passed and they're awaiting the governor's signature. There is a lot that states can actually do to increase consumer protections in the areas of both private loans and to alleviate some of the issues stemming from federal student loans. So for example, one thing that I foresee in the future is um, income-driven repayment forgiveness is not taxable until 2025. And that was done uh, through one of the bills during COVID at the federal level. New York follows federal rules when it comes to those tax rules. So in New York, technically, we didn't even need the bill that passed this legislative season confirming that because we do in general follow that rule. But that's only in effect until 2025. So let's say the federal government doesn't extend the non-taxing aspect of IDR forgiveness, then New York State would be in a position to actually tax any forgiven amount under that program. PSLF is not taxable both at the federal or state level. That's that's in code. So we're not worried about that. So uh, I can foresee next year us advocating to convince the state to pass a bill that doesn't tax forgiven student loans in the future after 2025. That is just a, one example. Again, these are all the bills. We're also trying to increase consumer protection for private student loan borrowers. You may not be surprised the number of people who are borrowing private student loans is um, a lot, a lot of people borrowing a lot of money. I will stop there and see if my colleague has any questions that she wants to elevate because I know I just cover a lot and said a lot, but here's her number. If you need one-on-one -on -one help, if this was too much for you, I totally get it reach out. We will give you a one-on-one. -on -one. We are very busy right now, so it might take us a couple of days to get back to you and assign you a counselor, but um, definitely reach out to us. Nancy? So there were no questions, but I did want to just bring up two quick things. Um, I think that it's important to mention that I know I have a lot of clients that have been getting letters recently saying that they've been placed in administrative forbearance when they actually didn't request that. Um, that is being done for the most part because the servicers have an obligation to send out bills at least 21 days in advance. And I think that they've just been falling behind in processing those bills. So the big question mark is if you don't get your bill and you don't make a payment in October because you're not required to under the administrative forbearance, does that month count towards forgiveness? That's something I think that we're going to have to do a little bit of a, uh, more exploration and, and discussion with the Department of Education to confirm that's the way it should be. And I'm sure all the advocates agree that that's the way it should be. But we'll just make sure that that gets done so that you don't get penalized for their um, inability to process on time. Carolyn. that I submitted a complaint this morning to DFS about that issue and I said excuse me I need you all to hold my borrowers harmless because it is not our fault that Mohila did not process this save application on behalf of my client and my client should not have to pay if they don't have a proper and timely invoice so you have an ally here I will be pushing back <laughs> Um, and then the only other thing that I wanted to mention, and I'm, you may have said this, Carolina, I might have just missed it, um, but for the IDR uh, account adjustment, they, if you have non-direct loans like FELP loans, Perkins loans, HEAL loans, you want to consolidate those loans by the end of the year in order to benefit, to get the, uh, the, the uh, maximum benefit of the IDR account adjustment. And there's many benefits to that. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't consolidate those loans last year, uh, next year, and make them eligible for the forgiveness programs, but you won't get retroactive credit if you do that. So to get retroactive credit, you need to consolidate before the end of the year, and we can certainly uh, help you with that. And uh, by the way, somebody asked, is this a free service? Yes, we are a free service. Absolutely free and, and and not because I'm like the director of the program. We're kind of a first in the nation program where we focus exclusively on providing direct consumer assistance to student loan borrowers. Student loans is all we do day in and day out. And Nancy can attest, we are passionate about this where it could be 10 p.m. and we're still like chatting on the latest regarding student loans. So this is um our main subject matter of expertise. We are funded by New York State. Everything is free. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Carolina. Um, as you all have heard, this is in, uh, super insightful, a lot of information, but I also know that uh, Nancy has been dropping, um, you know, on the chat, the phone numbers and the website so you can get better connected as well because it is a lot of information. And I do want to add also that Carolina is helping me with my um, process. Um, you know, thankfully, I worked in the public sector for about close to 10 years, if not more. So we're going to see, you know, how those payments, um, you know, transform to uh, being um, acknowledged that, you know, I'm almost or nearing completing the 10-year the, the requirement. To, to be in the program or to you know qualify for that for that um, benefit. Um, so great. Um, so now we're gonna move on to our second panelist here, which I'm also excited to to introduce. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about Amson Hagen and Amin Osika from the Debt Collective. And we're gonna now show you a, a different perspective, right? Um, about this fight, you know, and so um, Debt Collective is, um, you know, a group that organizes around around debt relief, uh, relief and uh, and debt cancellation. And they're going to tell us a little bit about what a Debt Collective does. Um, they are a local and a national group as well, and um, they're going to talk a little bit about uh, this um, student debt release tool that they um, work with and also about the work they do on canceling debt in general, right? And so I'm gonna uh, read um, the bio for Hampson. Um, Hampson Hagen earned his PhD in anth anthropology in 2022 and is a postdoctoral fellow at Michigan State studying humanitarian rescue in West Africa. Hampson is also an EMT combining his research on rescue with the pr practice of rescue. Over the course of all his ac academic training and despite his many jobs, Am Amson has amassed over $200,000 in student loan debt. He is trying to survive while pursuing his career path in education and wants an end to all forms of debt. Amson has been a part of the Debt Collective since 2020 when he was affiliated with the DC chapter before joining the New York chapter in 2021. <clears throat> and Amy's Osika's bio, uh, she's a member of the NYC branch of Debt Collective uh, and graduated from the New York School in 2021 with an MA in Anthropology, an MA in Historical Studies. Uh, she's an artist and an activist. And so without further ado, I'm going to leave the space for both of you to talk about that collective and enlighten us about this organizing you're doing. Hello, everyone. Uh, we, uh, Amy and I, have a, a set of brief PowerPoint slides for you all. Not very wordy, but we're going to share our screen. All right. So this is, if you can see this, this is our, uh, the mobile version of our website, the Debt Collective. If you 
look at the website on your computer, it'll be much wider. But um, here alone, our debts are, are a burden, but together um, owning our debts sort of make us powerful in the collective. So really briefly, we'll just talk about sort of where the debt collective came from uh, and give you uh, an overview of what we do and what we've done as a New York chapter. Um, Amy, uh, Amy and I and others in the New York chapter have done a uh, set of actions over the past few years. And then we will go into this debt collective tool that, uh, that folks at National have created for us. So Amy, could you uh, go over the sort of history of the debt collective really briefly? Okay. Um... Yes. So the Debt Collective began with Occupy Wall Street. Um, uh, real quick, I'll explain that Occupy Wall Street at its core was addressing the vast inequality that has, of course, always existed in America, but was drastically increased by the 2008 recession. Um, when the government chose to bail out the same banks that had effectively caused not just the national but global economy to collapse, uh, Occupy Wall Street used the government's leniency toward the banking industry as a way to draw attention to the many ways that corporations had developed an undue influence in government, especially financial services sectors like banks, credit card companies, insurance agencies, etc. In other words, their general concern was corruption. Um, and the conclusion being that the government's integrity had been compromised. And the debt collective originating out of this um, has recognized a shift in the government's approach to the ethical distribution of student loans and who should profit from education. Do you want me to continue with this or I could cut back to it later? Okay, let's go back to it later. I'll, we'll go to the next one. All right, so really, Quickly, I wanted to give an overview of who, one, who are uh, student loan borrowers and who are the people who comprise the debt collective. As you can imagine, it's a lot of different people. Here, I've got an image of teachers. Um, you have folks in food service, for example, people, who, food service and hospitality workers, um, part-time, full-time managers, interns, all these people, as you can imagine, can amass student loan debt and have. Uh, we've got older folks, some who've carried, unfortunately, carried student loan uh, debts uh, into their older years. Um, some have been able to retire despite it, and others have been blocked from sort of meaningful retirement because they still carry student loan debt. We also got folks who are still in college, uh, either taking out their first loans today, unfortunately, or are taking out loans to, loans to continue their education in school, whether it's undergraduate education or graduate school, professional schools as well, right? Um, the, a lot of folks, whether they've graduated or not, some of their parents have taken out uh, student loans on their behalf. And so you might have within a single household, multiple generations of folks with student loan debt. Um, a very difficult situation as I'm sure many of you, or some of you might've experienced already. And then we in the Debt Collective, along with other groups, are sort of actively uh, protesting the government, uh, no matter the administration, um, to hold our elected officials uh, responsible for not just having helped usher in this particular world in which we live in terms of like debt being a, an unfortunate normality for us, but also um, charging them with the responsibility to change our situation or politically, economically, and, and sort of doing so by eradicating student debt. And yes, we are everybody. We're everyone, right? So uh, the Debt Collective does primarily a uh, lot of actions, but we can fill them into sort of four distinct buckets, right? Um, first thing that the Debt Collective does is to sort of build a union, really want to uh, combine the sort of individual, all these uh, individual student debt holders or uh, borrowers and sort of build a collective power so we can sort of transform again our political um, situation that sort of allows and desires for these uh, loans to be the case 
as well as our economic uh, sort of system. So um, helping build a world of debtors, I'm sorry, building a union of debtors. We do not want a world of debtors, but uh, collectivizing all of our, our, our energies together to uh, have a stronger voice, right? In order to pursue a world in which no one has to loan debt. As you can imagine, the debt collective is about debt abolition. In fact, one of the previous iteration of the debt collective was called uh, strike debt. As you see these strikes on the right-hand side, we're still keeping that theme here about getting rid of student loan debt. Um, again, uh, debt abolition is one of the major features of the debt collective. And um, when you check out the website, you'll see that it's just sort of running ticker on the bottom uh, through uh, the debt collective's collective work. It's been able to sort of discharge or abolish over $31 million in student loan debt. Now, of course, compared to the totality of student loan debt that all the borrowers in the US sort of hold, 31 million is not that much, but um, considering at one point, not too long ago, it was zero, this is a big deal, right? Another thing that Debt Collective does and takes pretty seriously is uh, political education. Um, and the, the Collective does this through something called, we call the Jubilee School. Again, this is, a, this is an initiative, a series of activities to educate through uh, respective chapters, um, the various communities in which um, the Debt Collective has uh, sort of ample support. We want to educate people in these communities about um, their uh, about their options. And some of that involves uh, connecting us to partners like EdCap, some of the work that um, Helen and uh, Carolina are doing, right? Um, connecting to the other, um, other resources in the community because a lot of people have different forms of debt. Um, housing debt, medical debt. And when we are educating people, we're doing so not just about student loan debt, but all the other various debts that may um, affect their situation and, and really hamper their lives, right? So political, political education in short, it's another thing we do. The last thing we're gonna spend time on is campaigns. This is a lot of what people see about the debt collective, right? Um, this this image here was um, taken from a campaign in 2021 in May. Uh, this is in Red Hook, Brooklyn. And this was that uh, trying to educate uh, some NYCHA residents uh, in the in this in this neighborhood about um, what's happening in their neighborhood, sort of uh, taking a large scope in terms of debt um, and, and sort of giving them resources. Um, that they can contact to sort of help them out with some of the situations they may be facing. And again, it's various forms of debt. So you see here on the, the flyer we're passing out um, resources on how to how to properly file bankruptcy protection or bank file for bankruptcy protection. Um, there is something about preparing people on how to deal with scam calls and scam emails and, and all sorts of stuff like that. So another campaign we did in 2021, I think it was in September. This is in Washington Square Park. And this is a campaign to basically have folks like this person stand in front of or sit in front of a, a large sign that's written to Biden telling him to sign the executive order. Now, of course, this was two years ago when um, the situation was a little bit different in terms of the uh, national climate around student loans and what uh, ideas were about the the capability of the president to sign an executive order to abolish all debt. And of course the Supreme Court has ruled on this recently, but many of us still maintain the, the notion, the fact that the Biden administration and the president has the ability, has the authority to discharge debt. And I don't know if you want me to jump in there. You um, can. Okay. Um, Yes. So briefly um, mentioned was Carolina talking about the HEROES Act. Um, this has been criticized as something that would easily be struck down in the court because it was a law intended more for national disasters like hurricanes post 9-11 or in this case, the pandemic. And unfortunately, only about a month after Biden had proposed using the HEROES Act, he actually 
gave an interview in which he was kind of like, oh yeah, the pandemic crisis is over. So sort of shooting him himself in the foot. But as was also mentioned by Carolina, the Higher Education Act of 1965, this is not limited to disasters. It simply states that when you take out a student loan, you're borrowing money from the government and the government owns your debt. Even if they have another entity service your debt, the government still has legal ownership of it. And since the constitution gives the authority to control property of the government, they can legally do whatever they want with it. And this is not through Congress. This is actually the secretary of education who's given the unrestricted power to not only create the student loans as they did in 65, but also to compromise them, like alter them, um, and even to modify a debt down to zero sum. Uh, so talking about why this hasn't been done kind of ties back into the origins of the debt collective with Occupy Wall Street. Um, because despite the fact that these loans and affirmative action as well were, you know, part of the Great Society program that Lyndon Johnson had connected higher education with being key to um, upward mobility and, uh, you know, like advancement of society. Um, we've obviously seen that things do not work the way that they used to. Um, and since the Secretary of Education is appointed by the president and does not rely on Congress to make these decisions, answers directly to the president, why hasn't it happened? Um, I want to point people to the bankruptcy reform that Biden uh, was had a key role in in the late 90s and early 2000s. And uh, it was earlier mentioned the year 2005. This is a crucial time. So Biden has always claimed himself a champion of the middle class. Um, however, he was in full support and helped pass this, what was called the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005. And I won't go into too much of the detail. There are plenty of articles, um, which is great. I mean, they're old, obviously, but they're there on the internet. But what did the bill do? In general, it made personal bankruptcy more difficult um, and expensive, difficult to access. Um, but it was particular damaging, particularly damaging to student debtors, as we've discussed with the undue hardship clause that was put in there. So instead of protecting borrowers, the act protects and incentivizes private lenders to take on more vulnerable clients, knowing how difficult it is for their loans to be discharged. And it's not surprising that student loan companies tripled their contributions to federal campaigns in lobbying for that bankruptcy abuse act that Biden defended. And he didn't just support it. He did literally defend it at a Capitol, here, here, Capitol Hill hearing in 2005 against the expert witness, um, Elizabeth Warren. He has shown nothing but dedication to the forced repayment of debt, because if you can't effectively declare bankruptcy, you don't have a choice in whether you're, you can pay it or not. So this long and complicated story um, uh, connected with um, Biden's connection with uh, credit card companies in Delaware, bankruptcy abuse and all of that is to demonstrate that Biden's failure with the Supreme Court wasn't based on ignorance. No one is that ignorant at that high of a position in power. Um, there's a government bias against the cancellation of student debt on both the Republican and Democratic side, because as long as campaign finance is embroiled with the consumer credit industry, the government is literally invested in your debt. But student debt cancellation is legal. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise, not even the president. And so this is why we have a collective. And uh, Amson's going to continue to the next slide where um, we're talking about how uh, one of the ways that you can make your voice heard about your debt. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, really quickly, uh, last year, I don't know if you all remember, but there was this drive, the the 2000, sorry, the $20,000, $10,000 sort of forgiveness was a big deal. And um, in the Bronx, I think Carolina mentioned earlier that the Bronx has uh, within the five boroughs, one of the highest concentrations of uh, folks with student debt, but also student debt in default. Um, we really quickly did an action in uh, Park Chester uh, in front of the subway station to 
uh, with this form to like try and get folks signed up for PSL up. It was free, see these QR codes. We really wanted people to just sign up. We had, it was like a three minute, you know, process. We had, we had um, people sign up on their phones, on iPads. We really wanted people to take advantage of this to see if you can get your, if you can get 15, if it was a 10 to 20,000 at the time, the Biden administration was telling us it was gonna work. We tried to, we signed a bunch of people up that day, um, hoping that we could give some people a chance of relief, right? So we definitely had a lot of actions for cer certain things like this. And we had another teach-in, uh, this is also in 2021. Again, bringing people together, bringing various resources and folks uh, who could explain to people different aspects of the whole student debt issue and offer some folks, um, Carolina was there for this, <laughs> offer some folks some uh, resources on how to take advantage of their situation and, and uh, get some relief the best way they can. But um, as Amy mentioned, we have a new tool coming out, uh, just the other title, uh, Dish Better Have Our Money. Um, and you go on the website, you will see this, right? Uh, and the underlined portion at the, um, hold on, I like my pen. This underlined portion here, this online form demands the Department of Education use that power. So the form, which I'll show you in a second, the series of questions are like 17 pages. It takes about 15, 20 minutes to do, right? But it's a it's an online sort of form. You filled out like an online survey, similar to that. And at the end, the product is a letter. Here's the website, sorry. It'll tell you how it works. You'll click this. Um, it'll bring you to a series of questions. And then at the end, um, you will have a letter that will, another part of the website, the letter will look like this. And once you answer all these questions at the end, it will spit out this PDF and it would have uh, the address to this is sent, this is uh, Cardona, the Secretary of Education, Under Secretary of Education, um, and it would have some of the information that you would have put into these questions. And I'll show you the questions in a second, right? Here's the end of the letter. At the end, this would be your name, your address, your date of birth, if you put those things in. Um, this is like some of the interesting information that you would, there's a question that asks you for some of this stuff. Um, and it would ask you to respond about how student debt has affected your life. And you would add some of this information and it would come out in this letter. Um, here is also like a, another extension of, of those sorts of questions, right? Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, two or three of those questions right now, really quickly. Here's our information. I'll put some of the stuff in the chat. If you don't get it, if you already have it, perfect. But I'll quickly show you, I'm gonna leave this. We don't want those. And I'm gonna show you some of these questions, right? Okay, really quickly, here's the here's our website again. When you click that link, you know, the bitch better have our money stuff. First question, I'll ask you information. That's my name, that's my last name. None of this is true, it's not my birthday. But after all this information, you go on to page two, right at the end, continue. Right. Um, it'll ask you for student loan information. Carolina mentioned some of these. Amson, oh, it yes. looks like it's just showing your the PowerPoint presentation and not the the tool. I realize that now. Sorry. Um, well, thank you for the heads up. So, yes. like, while we're figuring that out, um, what's so great about this is it is in the form of a legal memo. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, it gives you the ability to personalize. Um, and of course, you can include as much or as little as you want about your experience. And um, it doesn't uh, just send it out immediately. You, of course, um, get to look it over and then you yourself um, email it to the Department of Education. But the wonderful thing is they are legally required to respond. Um, they might not obviously say, oh, yes, <laughs> forgive your loan. Right. Right. But they do have to look at it and uh, right. demonstrate it. Absolutely. So here's a, sorry about that snafu a couple seconds ago. You got 17 of these pages. It'll take about 15 minutes reasonably to do. 
you've seen stuff like this, general contact information. Again, this would be, this was a lot of the stuff would come out at the bottom of that letter I showed you earlier. Um, Carolina had mentioned a few of these uh, loan servicers. It's disgusting how many they are, but here's probably all of them. Pick which one, and for many of us, it may be more than one. I know I've got two loan servicers. You pick those, and then you would go to continue, and you'd go to the, I've loaded them up already. Where do you get your first take out your loan? For me, it was 2005. What a sad year. Continue. Um, did you graduate? I've graduated. Then you'd, you'd continue. And then there are more. Um, it'll ask you about Pell Grant. Um, it'll ask you about, do you owe more than a million dollars of student debt? I do not. Some people might. Not my business, but you can, you can answer that. Did you take out student loans for yourself or for your child or grandchildren or both? All right. It'll also ask you about 2020, 2021. I think a lot of this has to do with the pandemic, but did you make less than 125,000? Right. Now here, uh, cancellation eligibility. I wrote, oh, they ask you, how did how'd your situation change because you expected to receive loan cancellation? Well, I wrote, I couldn't follow my dreams. Now, I probably wouldn't say that in those words to these folks in this letter, but you could, right? Again, the expectation of student debt relief, you might have taken a, you might have been like, oh, let me take out a mortgage on a house, right? I'm going to have the student debt coming, student debt relief coming. I can finally start purchasing the things that I wanted to, that I held off because I had all this student debt. And now the student debt cancellation was canceled. Maybe you're in trouble, right? They ask you about your loan amount. Is your loan amount less than 10000 Mine is greater than, so if I put no. The last question I'll show you, again, it's more about loan amounts. Are you currently in an, uh, an IDR plan or not? There are various other questions. So these are generally the questions that you'll see when you fill out this tool. And at the end, again, it pops out this nice PDF letter for you. you it does not automatically send. If you're worried about this being like, I'm not, I, I want to take a look at it at the full letter before it goes off to Secretary of Education, you have that opportunity, right? It does not automatically send. It will be a PDF, you would download it, and then you would have to email it yourself to the Department of Education. You could also copy and paste it in a Word document and alter things if you want. Think of this as like a template, right? To create a letter for you to use to appeal to the Department of Education or your senator or your representative or whoever, right? So it's just a tool, right? And I, we will stop there. Bravo, bravo. Wow, I love that tool. It is so fascinating. Basically, you don't have to worry about writing your own letter. Basically, you know, the tool allows you to, you know, answer, respond to some questions, and then it puts it into a template and is off, you know, that is beautiful. Love it. Uh, well, thank you, guys. Um, I want to also acknowledge that, you know, uh, you know, the, the movement, right, the, the people, on the, <laughs> excuse me, the people on the ground um, that are are, are fighting for debt relief, that, that are, are fighting for debt cancellation. And I always, you know, thought that 10 or $20,000 wasn't enough. You know, I always thought that that was, you know, just a drop in the bucket, but, you know, we needed some real, you know, effective um, solutions, you know, and relief, you know, which is cancellation. Uh, we didn't get there, but, you know, I was optimistic and I was, um, you know, positive that this would be a positive result in the courts, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So we want to acknowledge, right, the movements on the ground, the people that are fighting, that are pushing our elected officials, um, that are creating a movement to, to and put pressure on those that can make that difference, you know, th those that, you know, represent us, you know, on the local level, uh, on the federal level as well. So that is um, very important to, to state. And, uh, and this is what Debt Collective is about. So thank you for being here, guys. Um, and now in the interest of time, I really 
want to, I'm excited actually to introduce this other person. Um, she is someone that um, her debt was uh, relieved. Um, and so now she's debt free and she's gonna tell us all about um, this experience and the process. So I'm really excited to introduce you to Samelis Lopez. I'm gonna read her bio. And you know she's a friend of mine, and um, we've been on the trenches together, on the front lines, on different movements, on the New York Health Act. Um, you know, you you name it. Um, she was also a candidate, um, which uh, many, some of you may know. And I, I um, worked on her campaign, or I volunteered on her campaign rather. And yeah, her name is Samelis Lopez. Um, uh, she's an activist who has dedicated herself to serving the Bronx community. Samelis graduated from Columbia University <clears throat> and earned her master's degree in urban planning with a focus on housing and community development from New York University. Having grown up facing housing and food insecurity, Samelis decided to focus on helping to build affordable housing as a pro project manager after obtaining her master's degree to prevent others from ending up in the shelter system like her and her family once were. Since graduating, Samelis has been saddled with predatory six-figure student debt that was forgiven through the PS PSLF program this year with assistance from EDCAP, Debt Collective, and her union. <clears throat> Samelis was one of the Hispanic Coalition of New York's Rising 40 Under 40 La Latino stars in 2016 and has received recognition from city and states Bronx Power 50, Bronx Power 100, and Latino Power 100. Without uh, further ado, I want to introduce you to Samelis, who's going to um, tell us about her experience and how she got to where she is being uh, debt free. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for creating this space to have this event. I'm so honored to share my experiences. Um, thank you, Nestor, Carolina, Amson, Amy, for continuing the fight. So like Nestor read in my bio, I had six-figure debt after I graduated um, from NYU a few years ago. And it was something that you know I didn't talk to anybody about. I remember, you know, sometimes feeling a sense of shame, like, how did I get into this situation? And I didn't talk to anybody about this until I linked up with Carolina last year, and she literally physically walked me through the application process so I can consolidate my FFEL loan at the time into a direct student loan that allowed me to qualify for the public service loan forgiveness program. And luckily at that point, I had over 10 years of public service experience. And then because of the temporary waiver for the PSLF program, they were able to look back in time and give me retroactive credit that was um, that basically allowed me to get rid of that debt. So psychologically, emotionally, mentally, I just feel so liberated. I feel free. I feel that it's my mission to pay this forward and allow people, you know, to feel the satisfaction, you know, like that you feel when you don't have debt, right? When you don't have the predatory student debt over you, you know, as I once was. So I urge you to link up to these organizations. Um, Ed Cap from the Community Service Society, definitely link up to Carolina. I actually met Carolina at an event like this, and she put her contact information at the end of the slide. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take charge of this. I'm going to take control, and I'm going to figure this out. And the reason it took me so long to figure this out is because I didn't really have faith in the system. Because at the time that I was coming up, the public service loan forgiveness program, it just had like a 1% acceptance rate, right? So I was like, you know what, I'm not even going to bother applying. So let me just like push through and, you know, figure it out when I figure it out. And then, you know, that initial conversation with Carolina, she helped me see that, yeah, we can do something about this. Consolidate your loan step by step. Um, and the process in itself took over like a year from the time that I submitted my application to consolidate into the direct student loan program and PSLF 
to about March or April of earlier this year, where I finally got the notification from Mohila that my loan was forgiven. And at first, like, I didn't believe it. And I would check Mohila like three times, four times a day. Okay, what's the update? What's going on? And I couldn't sleep one night. And it was like three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. And I was like, you know what? Let me just see what's going on with Mohila. And I ended up getting the notification that it was, you know, forgiven. And I just couldn't believe it. And I didn't sleep that whole night. And then Carolina was one of the first people I reached out to and my union and a couple of other folks. I was like, okay, this is a notification that I got from Mohila. Is this correct? You know, this payment tracker, am I reading this correctly? And like, yeah, it's, it's true. You're debt free. So after years and years of suffering silently with this debt, it was finally forgiven. And I say this because I am a fairly involved person in the community and, you know, connected to different spaces and different movements. And if someone like me is feeling the sense of shame and guilt, right, and not knowing like who to turn to or what to do in the situation, imagine the next person. Imagine the next person that's such privilege as us to be connected to each other and know what these movements are and what's in stake for them, right? Imagine, you know, someone who doesn't speak the language. Imagine someone who has a disability, right? It's really important for us to team up together and spread the word about this um, because this can bring relief to people's pockets and put more food on the table, you know? And at the end of the day, like that's something that, that's what it meant for me. Um, so, you know, whenever you hear people telling you this is an elite issue, Poor and working class people are the majority of the people taking out this debt to finance their education because rich people, wealthy people are not taking out debt. They can just pay it, you know? So don't let anybody convince you that this is an elite issue and, you know, let's discuss it like for another time. This is like impacting people's lives. It's gonna make a difference to get the student loan cancellation, to enroll in these payment plans so you can figure, you know, to put more food on your table every night. And with that said, I want to encourage everybody to join us because we're going to be doing street outreach in the community to reach people and to talk people to the program that, you know, Carolina and Amy and Ash spoke about tonight. We actually did that table in Parchester last year um, that was really successful. And we would love to hear from you and to build community with you and to get this information out to the community, like on the streets. So please sign up in the link. And I think either Nestor or Ting are going to drop in the Zoom chat so you can join us um, so we can build that community together and get as many people to take advantage of these programs as possible. So with that said, you know, I'll turn it over to the panel and thank you for having me today. And thank you so much, Carolina, Amson, and Amy for all the advocacy that you're doing because you really made a difference in my life. Thank you for sharing your story. I think it's it's nothing better than getting um, a true story and you're right. Like the one, there should be absolutely no shame whatsoever. And yet we mm -hmm. see who have it. And two, aside from the financial impact of having to pay this student loans, I can tell you from my clients, the psychological impact and the impact it has on mental health is real. Absolutely. And pretty severe. To not have to think about making a payment, I'm sure mm -hmm. like next month is so relieving. You just don't have to deal with it. And we want to get um we want to address this. I and I am with the debt collective. Obviously, my program helps people like deal with it now. There are 2.4 million New Yorkers, but the issue is beyond the one-on-one. -on -one. We need policy changes. And it doesn't mean that you cannot pursue your own forgiveness path and not do that advocacy letter. You could do both. There's nothing preventing you from doing both. And I really encourage you. This is a big issue that I can tell you. We've managed uh, to have our entire government make us believe that this is normal. If you go abroad and someone asks you, what do you do for a living? And I say, this is what I do for a living. They are puzzled by the fact that we have a student lending system. And the first question they'll ask, what about if you don't finish school? Do you still owe that debt? And they cannot comprehend why the United States would do that to anyone. So this is not normal. It should not be normal. And mm -hmm. just remember, the government is using taxpayer money to lend us money and then charge us higher interest rates than they charge the banking institutions and then not allow us to discharge it in bankruptcy. And yet 
you could get a million dollars to establish a business, the business doesn't do well, and you can file bankruptcy the next day. We know clear examples of people in power who have done that repeatedly. So the system mm -hmm. is not normal. It's not working. It hasn't been working. So I really appreciate the Debt Collective and their initiative. Uh, amazing work in the last years. Again, that doesn't prevent you from getting the relief that you should be working towards because you do have a reality. You have bills to pay. You want to be done with your own debt. But again, you could also see the advocacy level as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I hope that you can join us in the streets to get the word out because so many people are in need. And like what Carolina and Amsterdam said earlier about the Bronx having the highest student loan default rates in the entire city, I mean, that's something that will make an impact. So we really hope that you sign up and we hope to see you soon in the community. Thank you, Samelis, for sharing your story. Um, you are inspiring so many. I know you're inspiring me, so I'm checking my app, my Mohila app every day, maybe a few times a day, just to see what the process is like. That's what I did. <laughs> and uh, so, so yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone here as well. Um, but I wanna, in the interest of time, I wanna open it up for questions now. Um, the space is now for you to ask any of our panel, uh, any, any of our panelists questions. So uh, please, you know, I welcome you to ask away. You want raised hands, Nestor, or how do you want to do it? We can do raised hands. It's only a few of us here. <laughs> I think Helen has her physical hand up. Um, my daughter um, has student loans, more than 10,000. She um, got a master's in library science. In just before the pan, she was paying it. Just before the pandemic, in fact, on March 31st, she moved, she emigrated. She went to Canada. She now lives in Canada. Um, she didn't have to pay because everything was suspended during COVID. Is the fact that she's now in Canada, she's still an American citizen. Does that impact her ability to get one of these, get help on these programs? So probably yes, no, depending on which program. Okay. So for public service loan forgiveness, it would be hard even if you, she's working for like yeah, a sure. nonprofit equivalent. Um, for income-driven repayment, uh, it's interesting because um, one, I would encourage you to give her our contact information and schedule one-on-one -on -one session. She can ask for me if she if you want. There's there's this question: the government uses your taxes to uh, base your income driven repayment. So if she is in Canada not filing US taxes, and I don't know if that's the case, then the post is a good question. Will the government say she has no IRS required income and maybe she will be eligible for a zero required payment and then she would be eligible for the 20 to 25 year forgiveness. Whether that's appropriate for her or not, it's gonna depend on like her loan balance and her goals, right? So that's why it would require a one-on-one -on -one session for us to discuss all the possible options to figure out what's the short-term strategy and long-term strategy um, for her to make an informed decision. Okay. I I know that she um I know that it uh, that she does pay taxes because we help her with them. And <laughs> so I and she she does pay uh and um I think probably income forgiveness is the is the one that she you know, yeah, it probably will. So um, because right. we, we are a small group, I'll put my email in the chat um, so you don't have to go through our helpline in case you want to just forward her my email. Um, I am comfortable with that. Give me a second. Mm -hmm. And Helen, that's the same thing that I did. I reached out to Carolina literally and within like two days, she reaches out to me to schedule an appointment um, and then she walked me through my application. So 
this is exactly how the process started for me. Thank you, Samilis. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see what we got. We have Ivan. I had to turn my mic on. Um, does anybody know any scenario where if you're defaulted on your student loan, can they put a lien on your house if you happen to own a house? The federal government is unlikely to do that if it's a federal loan. If it's a private loan, that may be like a different matter because they would take you to court, sue you, and then look at your assets. And yes, but if it's a federal loan, they're not going to, they don't have the capacity generally to do that. What they can do easily, however, and they, it happens, they can garnish your wages if you're still working administratively they don't take you to court they just send you a little notice that in 10 days we're getting uh, x percentage from your employer so they can do that and then if you're not working or they're not catching you because they're just not catching you uh, on your work they will wait until you get social security retirement and offset 15 percent of your income from retirement which is egregious and then on top of that, if you do your taxes and you were owed a refund, whether at a federal level and sometimes like state, there's some different question there, who, depending on who has the loan, whatever, um, they will take it away. So we, COVID, during COVID, they suspended all collection activities. But I can tell you prior to COVID, the number one reason why clients were looking for services was because they had a social security offset or and or um, foreseeing a tax uh, refund intercept. It doesn't go away. And they do this administratively. Literally, the Department of Education sends a nice little notice to the IRS and says, find me this person and get me anything that you can um, in the process. Is it, would it strictly always be 15% or is 15% the maximum? That's the current rule. Yeah. Is it ever lower than 15%? Nope. Uh, I think one of the things, and I should acknowledge this, I've had clients that say, I'd rather be on the 15% social security offset because that would be cheaper than like one of the plans or I just know I'm never going to repay this on my own. I'm going to have yeah. issues managing it. And that is still a viable option. However, if you have arguably low balances, reach out to me. I've been successful at compromises. That's the equivalent of settlements for the federal government. As Amy mentioned, the government does have the authority to compromise, waive, and relieve bars. Um, the only times I've been able to do that is on compelling cases where I'm like, listen, you either take what I'm about to offer you or I'm going to place my client in an income zero dollar repayment plan and you'll never see a penny. And then I tell them like, my client has been trying to pay this for 50 years, let it go. You're like wasting taxpayer money trying to collect on this debt. So those are the type of cases I've been successful at. Um, but it, I have a feeling right now, if you wanted to try to reach um, a compromise, let me know. I'm happy to give it a try and and see if we can help you, if we can help anyone who is in that situation. I don't want to say you, but if anyone is in that situation, usually has to be lower levels of debt. If it's higher then you know, they have very specific rules that they follow. And let's just say that they don't lower too, too much of the debt unless there's a super, super compelling case. Do you, do you help people that live outside of New York State? I will do the the exception. Okay. That's all. Thank okay. you. No problem. Carolina, I actually have a quick question. Um, let's say that your student debt was forgiven and you're like, you know, filing taxes and all that good stuff. How do you account for that in the taxes? Just, you know, for anybody who's curious and we want to know. No, you, it's actually funny. I had a client that um, it was a private loan, interestingly, it wasn't even a federal loan. I did reach um, a private loan modification, the first and probably the last one, because you can never get those. It was with a credit union upstate. And um, the lender wanted to issue, don't quote me on it, it's like 1098. It's like, 
whenever you're forgiven debt, they will report it to the IRS and give you that form for you to report it, or they won't report it. They'll give you that form and it will be treated like income generally. But because there was the, the federal rule that passed or the, the agreement that they were not going to tax forgiveness up until 2025, I was able to pull up that language. And I can't remember which of the bills during COVID that passed. I pull up the language and I sent it and told the person, go to your legal team and let them know that, yeah, you can issue whatever you want, but we're not reporting it because one, we're not liable for this debt according to X, Y, and C, any forgiven amount, um, federal student loans, whether federal or private, it, it's higher education debt, I think was the language, we don't have to report it. So basically, you don't have to report it. In your case, public service loan forgiveness, you don't mm -hmm. have to do anything. It's, it's, it's great, because imagine if you get like 100,000 forgiven, and then they want to tax it at the federal state. That's like $30,000, depending on your tax bracket. <laughs> No. Thank you. Yep. Question? Pilar. Yeah, Pilar has a question. Yes. Hi, I have a question about um credit score. So I have my my student loans was sold from GSMR to Ed Financial. And then over the summer they decided that they were going to get a whole new system. So then at one point it said like zero loan um, and now it's back. And that hurt my credit score like by 50 points. And I asked them like, what are you gonna do about it? I'm job hunting, I just graduated. Um, this could be something that might hurt me. And they're like, oh, well, there's really nothing we can do. That's, that's normal. Um, it'll go back up on its own or whatever. So just to confirm, your, your student loans went from one servicer to another and they're federal loans, right? I think you mentioned the mm -hmm. service. They're all federal loans. So um, it is true that I've seen cases where, in fact, when these transitions are happening, you may actually see on your credit report twice the debt, right? Like if you owe 100000 then all of a sudden it's 200000 because of that transition. Now, you should be able to file a report with the credit bureaus saying that it should not be impacted. If they don't do anything about it, file a complaint with FSA. You're going to get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. You should not be adversely impacted by the fact that they're transitioning your loans from one to another. My understanding was that in general, like there shouldn't be such a big hit or like something that meaningful and that it should clear out as soon as like they clear out the transfer from one to another. But those are the type of issues that I'm interested in hearing about. So if you want to reach out and you you want me to help you out, file the complaints with both DFS and FSA, I'm happy to do that. Um, usually we do say start with a credit bureau, send them an official letter saying like, you should not be doing this, um, address it. If they don't, if they don't address it, I'm thinking even the CFBP might be like up in their alley with this issue, um, but happy to help if needed. Yeah, I'll definitely be contacting you because then I had another issue with them um, where I had requested because now my student loans have been, I don't know how many people, like or how many um, places have gone to because I first graduated from undergrad in 2008 um, and then I went back to school. And okay. so they supposedly sent me this thing that shows how much like I actually owed how much was principal, how much was interest. And I'm I'm 100% sure that number is wrong because I know at one point I had like a, melt, a meltdown because I owed like $110,000. And that's not shown on there. It shows like, yeah. So, and then when I first called them and asked for it, they were like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll send it to you. And then the second time I called, they're like, we don't have any requests on file. We have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah reach out yeah thank you yeah. and it's not uncommon by the way like I don't even want to talk about like the the data transfer issues <laughs> that happen and just to clarify there's a common misconception in general for most borrowers 
all these servicers like Nelnet, Advantage, those are contracted by the federal government to manage the loans, but they're not your lender and they have to follow the same federal rules. So regardless of your servicer, you should be eligible for the same repayment plan options, forgiveness options and all that. They're not your lender. The ones that may still be your lender is if you still have loans with Navian, those are like privately FFE held loans where there is a lender that it's not directly the Department of Education. There was a portfolio the Department of Education bought back in 2010, I want to say, and that they are still FFEL, which you would still need to consolidate and make them into direct to be eligible for the forgiveness programs, but they're not like commercially held per se. My takeaway on this, there is nothing good in terms of staying with FFEL or Perkins loans. Like nothing mm -hmm. good is going to come out of them. Okay. Get rid of them. If you have AES, Navian, your loans didn't benefit from the payment pause, you already missed out on a lot. Don't miss out on more. If you want to be eligible for the safe plan, you have to consolidate. And as Nancy mentioned, by December 31st to get the, any retroactive credit you may be eligible for. Mm -hmm. Can I add something real quick, Carolina? So like in this consolidation process, what I ended up doing just because I was paranoid that they're going to lose my student data once the consolidation happened, I went into the federal student, um, is it FSA.gov website? And I downloaded my student loan data and I have it like in a flash drive, you know, just to, you know, make sure, um, you know, because I was just worried that after the consolidation process, like all my data was going to be deleted, you know, I wasn't going to have access to it. So in your journey, like definitely, you know, download as much information as you can about your case and like your student loan data. So you can always have that with you and keep track of any correspondence you receive from your servicer, um, especially when you get your forgiveness letter, which, you know, I'm hopeful that that will happen for you too. save your letter, you know, just in case. A. Kaplan, you, you have a question? Um, yes, hi. I'm wondering if any of you are familiar with the um, the district attorney loan forgiveness programs issued through the uh, Justice U.S. Department of Justice program, and in New York State, it's administered through the Higher Ed HESC. What's your question? And I I can speak generally and then if i need to i'm happy to follow up with you and you have my email in yeah. the chat and I'm um, yeah i i reached out to them last year because they issued me a 1099 miscellaneous mm. and um it should have been issued as a 1099c and i i tried to get them to understand that there was a um a letter issued by the department of justice stating that these types of payments that I get um, qualify as a public service um, payment and that they shouldn't be reported as income. But the 1099 miscellaneous is income reported and I will have to fight the IRS when they recognize that that money that was distributed to me as a part of their New York State's distribution of federal grant money, <laughs> and I, 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 they won't. The New York State will not recognize the money as a a grant that doesn't have to be repaid. There's a there's a couple of rules that I'm thinking about. Um, there was this state bill that I'm going to have to research back and maybe tap into another colleague to refresh my recollection that was trying to make sure that the um, the HESC forgiveness programs, and for those of you not familiar, HESC is the state agency that now uh, um, oversees financial aid, but they used to actually be a guarantee agency for the banks who had issued the felt loan. So, you know, anyways, they were all involved in this business. They finally got out of it, which I think it's a really good thing. Um, and, or they're transitioning, closing the, down that shop. So they have a bunch of forgiveness programs on their website. Um, I feel that there might be a state rule that should protect you, but I am thinking worst case scenario, I send you the citation that I use um, under the 2020, the forgiveness tax exemption under 2025, should the IRS have an issue with you. 
in terms of getting has to issue you the right form, I'm happy to help you file a complaint. See if we can escalate yeah. my, with my contact. Yeah, because I, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm a lawyer and I've I've researched this and I know that there's a federal um, regulation that I can cite to the IRS, but it could all be easily taken care of if they could just issue it as a 1099-C, but for whatever reason, it comes as a 1099 miscellaneous. Yeah, and they actually have a disclaimer in that program that they would issue a 1099, um, but it doesn't say C. Uh, all this to say, I can, I mean, I don't want to get your, I won't lie, getting anything rectified or getting any communication from Hess has been a challenge in my practice uh, okay. and in my experience to where we can try. I'm happy to help you try that out, but I wouldn't hold my breath. I am I may be okay. like, let's try it well, to have record as an attorney, paper trail is key. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we can just take the next step if needed, just to cover your bases. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to forge ahead with this for others benefit. Um, I know yeah. how to argue it, but it just seems like they're setting themselves up for problems and probably have in the past and other people might not know that the money that's distributed through this program shouldn't be taxed yeah. and just haven't been bothered to fight it and it just mm -hmm. seems wrong so I agree. okay thank you no problem amazing um wow the the time has uh is already nine so I just wanted to kind of speed up the process here. Um, Tang, are you able to uh, post the results from the poll earlier? Sure thing. Here's the first one. So drum roll, please. So do you currently have student debt? Wow, 67% of us said yes. That includes me <laughs> as well. Hmm. Can we move on to the other one? Yes, I think I was in there. Sure. Well, this one, sure. Is that what Kate said? Well, she said, well, it's disappointing, really. Not for you, So, that one, for some reason. Well, while we're waiting for that, I want to give a huge shout out to Pilal for signing up on the street outreach team um, so that we can stay connected and figure out ways to get this information out into the community. So thank you, Pilal. And also while Ting- um, oh, Wait a minute, up, I see. Here we go, here we go. Okay. Sorry about that. If you have student debt, what is the amount you owe? Sure, uh, why not? Oh, wow. Right. There's a lot of us at different spectrums. <laughs> oh my goodness. Very interesting. Ooh. Very interesting. Mm. Thank you, Tim. <clears throat> so how many years did it take you to pay off? Less than five years. Oh, wow. 21 years to 30 years. That's a very long time. Huh. And the next one? Um, hey, uh, Nestor, um, Amson and I actually um, are supposed to reconvene with some of the other New York branch, um, if it's okay, if, if you guys don't mind. Uh, we're supposed to enter okay. another. No, no problem. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll definitely circle back because uh, this is not over. We, we need to continue Thanks. educating people. And so hopefully we can count on you for other similar um, workshops. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. Amson, Amson, we'll see you in the streets. Yes, Absolutely. You Bye, you all. Thank you. <laughs> Get rest, everyone. <laughs> thank you. And the last one? Yes. Cancel public college. Cancel it. Cancel it. Cancel that. 
All right. Um, so I just before we, um, you know, say farewell uh, fully, uh, um, Gene, are you able to put the the link up on the chat? I just want to share this link with you because I am part of Bronx Nipan and we do um, all kinds of activities and we're involved on progressive movements. We are currently um, doing tablings around New York Health Act. Uh, and so we will love your support to be out there with us. Um, it's fun. Um, and there's others that are uh, doing this work as well, informing people in the community. And by the way, we're in... We're doing tablings in Hasty's district called Hasty. He's the speaker, um, and you know um, he's a speaker, but he's he he represents uh, an area in the Bronx. So yeah, so we welcome you to join us. We have a monthly meetings, and this this was one of them. And so please, you know, join us and check us out. But with that said, uh, because of time, we have to wrap it up. Um, thank you to all the panelists, to Carolina to Amson, to Amy, to those behind the scenes, to Samelis, to Ting, to Jean, to Helen. Helen right there, she's a rock star. She's a soldier. You should see her. Uh, she is definitely rocking and she's definitely out there, you know, pushing and pushing on the front line. So thank you, Helen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bron uh, thank you, Naipan, uh, for all your support. Ting, thank you so much, okay? And so with that, have yourselves a very good night. Thank you all.